Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, we continue our History 101 lecture series with our final Roman Empire, the problems of catastrophic failure. The Pax Romana success. Well, were there problems in the Roman Empire? Yes, there were. Bad emperors were a problem. Caligula, Nero. If there was there was too much power in bad hands. Having an emperor worked when you had Trajan and Hadrian and Octavian Augustus. But the train went off the rails when you had a Nero or a Caligula. It was simply too much power in one person's hands. The second thing is there was no rule for succession. Emperors weren't kings. They were just generals. Remember, Romans hate kings. So you couldn't be a king. You couldn't hand over that power to somebody else. So who could be emperor? Well, any adult man who could command the loyalty of the legions could be the successor. So that leaves a gaping problem of who the next emperor will be. Now, a current emperor could designate, could say, could show to everybody, could make in charge of the of the northern armies his favorite, you know, his son or or his nephew or his son-in-law. Remember, it's got to be in the family, even the extended family. But he could do that to get them a reputation, to get them experience. And, you know, could could go, yes, this will be the person who should succeed, succeed me. Doesn't mean it will be. What if they have a brother or a cousin who's at one of the other armies? What if they're a bad emperor? They can't command the loyalty of the legions. So every bad emperor threatens to have a civil war. Caligula, Nero. Nero actually ends in civil war. Legions are marching on Rome when he kills himself. In the, th in the 200s, in the 3rd century, we're going to see the 3rd century crisis is civil war after civil war after civil war because generals nobody could command the loyalty of the entire empire there was no one to bring them together so generals just kept fighting each other third the third problem is there's enemies outside the borders they're the germans we talked about following the tudenberg forest battle there in the north there's the goths in the northeast in kind of let's the the Poland modern Poland region Poland Bulgaria Romania uh well Bulgaria's in the empire Romania um parts of Hungary I'm trying to think of trying to into into put the two maps the Roman map at its furthest extent and the modern map and I'm doing it in my head and it's not so easy but it's north of the Danube, the northeast. And then there's the Sassanid Persians, a new Persian empire, a new Persian dynasty called the Sassanids. They're in the east, and they they want to recreate the Achaemenid Persian empire. They want to recreate the empire of Cyrus, which means the Romans who own half of that empire, Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, uh, Palestine, what they call Palestine, but is the land of Cana. Um, that's all stuff that the Sassanids quote want back because Cyrus had owned it once. So that means there's going to be war. There's war in the East. There's a lot of war in the East. So you get peace in the core, Italy, Spain, North Africa, but you get raid warfare on the frontiers. Every couple of years, you get an army of Germans crossing the river to get food, to get some money, to get some resources, to sack and attack. Uh, the Goths do the same. The Sassanids want to stay. They, they are more 
civilized, quote unquote. They're, they're more big armies, siege equipment. When they invade Mesopotamia, they want to take cities and own them. So they're even a diff- they're not even raiding. They're they're conquering warfare. So that's even more involved. But the f- point of the matter is. There's these wars, there's these constant wars on the border, and most people don't see them. They're in Italy, they're in southern Gaul, they're in North Africa, they're in Spain and Portugal, they're in Greece, they're in Egypt. They don't see these wars, they don't see these battles. So they they don't see the dangers that are out there, and they dislike paying taxes for it. It's one of those, like, how do I know where my money goes types of things. They're paying taxes for things that they don't feel threaten them. It's two is you need to maintain an army on the border. Roman emperors could never take the northern army away from the German border. Take the northeastern army, the Danubian army away from the Danube. Much less the eastern army out of Syria. It had to always be there because there were always enemies on the borders. So you always needed the money to maintain the legions. You can never save money. You can never cut expenses on the army. Every emperor was always faced with the same problem. No matter how much money he had coming in, he had three major armies. He always had the fund and they were expensive. So they always had to find the money, which means they always had to collect taxes, which means people were always upset. There's always a low level grumble about their taxes. Now, the Roman army was better than the Germans, the Goths or the Sassanids, and the Roman army could crush them. On an ordinary day, the Roman army was far superior to their, their three enemies. But what if it didn't? Or worse, what if it didn't want to crush its enemies? What if it was okay with the Germans raiding Northern Gaul? Or the Goths crossing the Danube? What if that would aid one general to become emperor? That's a problem. So how does the Roman Empire collapse? This is one of the most discussed topics in all of written history. And so I won't get into many of the different theories. Um, whether it was lead or um, an old textbook we used to use uh, blamed you know, marriage declines and not having enough children and stuff like that. There's lots of different reasons. There's like 300 and something reasons that historians have given over the years from Christianity made everyone wimps to the lead was in the pipes and made everyone dumb. Um, my I come down on the kind of Occam's razor. I come down with on the side of the leadership was bad. And people simply didn't care. People stopped believing in Rome. That's what it was. They were okay with Rome collapsing. Their lives no longer were positively affected by connection to the Roman emperor. In a way they had been. I guess that's the way way I come down on. Um, Because... I might as well say this here. You had an empire of 50 million people. They got invaded by barbarians. <sighs> Excuse me. They got invaded, invaded by barbarians of maybe 100,000 people total. Are you telling me 50 million people couldn't organize and crush these people? Of course they could. So why didn't they? Why is there no Cincinnatus? Why is there no Scipio? Why is there no rally to organize and unify? Why? Because people didn't want to. They didn't care. They didn't need to. The Western Roman Empire died in people's hearts. 
That's what it did. It faded away. Because it survives in the East, where you had better leadership, you had more money. So let's talk about the collapse. Well, we have the Pax Romana from 27 BC, which is um, Octavian's secession. Octavian defeats Mark Antony and takes over as emperor to 180 AD, the death of Marcus Aurelius, who is really the last great emperor. Um, sure, you could talk about Constantine, who's okay, but he also murdered his wife. Didn't he murder his wife? And he, he dumped his most popular son into a boiling vat of oil because he was jealous of his popularity. So he was a bit of a jerk. Um, Diocletian is a kind of savior for a bit of the empire, but also changes the emperor, the job of emperor. He kind of makes the job of emperor into a god uh, that you, like, kind of like the Chinese emperor. You don't see them. You, you can't talk to them. They are so far above you and better than you. You know, it's like the Queen of England and her, her, her holy blood. She's chosen by God to be in charge of England and Great Britain. You know, he kind of invents that, whereas Octavian is, is approachable. He's he's a princep, which we get the word prince from, but that meant first citizen. He's he's not supposed to be, quote unquote, special. Was he? Yes. But he wasn't supposed to be. It's kind of like our, our, in some ways, our senators, right? I should be able to go and make an appointment with Cory Booker. Why? Because he represents me. I am a constituent. I If I have a problem, I should be able to call up his office and talk to one of his people and, if possible, find a time to meet with him, if only for 10 minutes. That's his job. That was what an emperor was supposed to do. And Marcus Aurelius actually is famous. There's several stories of Marcus Aurelius being emperor on his way to a great battle or something. And a woman comes up with a, with a, with a problem, with a contract problem. And she's like, emperor, emperor, come and fix my problem. And he's like, I don't want to do it. I, I got other things to do. I'm, I'm fighting the Germans. I got to go make, uh, I got to go make a movie. I got to go make Gladiator. I got to go star in that movie for uh, the first 20 minutes till I die. And the old woman goes, well, if you don't have time for your people, then stop being emperor. And Marcus Rosa says, okay, you're right. You're right. He gets off of his horse, goes underneath an apple tree, and reads her petition. Then makes a decision. It gets carried out by one of his, his seconds, and he moves on. That's the idea. That's that's kind of the George Washington presidency where almost anybody could walk into the executive mansion and like, hey, George, I can you can you have five minutes? Well, yes. Who are you? Well, I'm a I'm a farmer in New Jersey. I figured I'd come to Philly and talk to you about a problem I've got with my pigs. You know. So. Diocletian will change that. Diocletian um, comes before Constantine. This is in the in 280 um, in the early 300s. I mean, Constantine's famous for making Christianity legal, and that's important. But I don't know if he's a great emperor. I just don't know. He's the last really great one is Marcus Aurelius, and the kind of wheels start falling off the wagon after him his son commodius is the first bad emperor in a hundred years since nero and he's bad he is awful he's just awful his death instigates the third century crisis which is a hundred years of instability from 180 to 280 a.d that's where diocletian will come in at 280 um and it's the empire is adrift. You have bad emperors. You have general equals generals revolting, which means there's an emperor with no legitimacy. So without the legitimacy, more emperors revolt. So it's this kind constant treadmill of of a general conquering Rome, saying I am the emperor, and then all the other generals saying F you, man, and then they take their armies away from the borders and march into Italy and fight it out. So it's a giant PvP brawl in Italy. Meanwhile, the Germans 
And the Goths and the Assassins are like, well, if there's no one on the border, I guess I'll just enter. So you get border problems. So any new emperor who wins and finally defeats the other generals turns around and goes, oh, I fu- oh I'm being invaded. And has to now take an army that has been beaten up in a civil war, you know, Romans slaughtering Romans, and then has to march north or northeast or to the east in order to fight an invasion. So that means the army is a worse army. Because Romans don't want to fight in a civil war because it's dis- destructive. It's uh, the worst thing you could be in is in a Roman civil war, which means middle class Romans and elite Romans don't want to be in it. And even really poor Romans don't want to be it. But remember, the army is the way you can make new Romans. So foreigners or non-citizens will still join up. They actually start hiring mercenaries, Germans and Goths. Well, rather than getting invaded by them, we'll hire them to be our army. Well, they're mercenaries. They're not citizens. They don't know how to fight like Romans, and they won't fight like Romans. They will continue to fight in their own styles. Now, that's the way the Persian army worked, right? But remember, the Persian army was big, but it lost to Alexander's highly efficient, unified army. Where all the men, Macedonians and Greeks, fought together in the same style. They spoke more or less the same language. They understood the same tactics. That's not what the Roman army is becoming. The Roman army is becoming this Roman core in the middle, surrounded by all of these Germans and Goths and mercenaries. The armies are losing their professionalism. They're becoming not only loyal to just the emperor, many times they're not loyal to the emperor. They're loyal to the paycheck. And if they don't get paid, they start looting. They don't, and they will switch general to generals or they'll go home. And there's no help from patricians. They left Rome with uh, in Octavian's day. They want to be big fish in a small pond, so you can't call upon them. So in the third century crisis, there, there's no large pool of talented um, nobility to call upon. Like there was in the age of Cincinnati. They just don't exist anymore. They, their skills have atrophied. The Senate is full of yes men. None of those guys can lead an army. They're, none of them are useful. And so the empire for a hundred years is adrift. Now it's big. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of culture as we talked about. So it can recover. It just needs stability. Basically, the Roman empire has had a heart attack in the third century crisis. And it needs some rest. It can recover from that heart attack. It's not dead. It didn't even die on the on the table, on the operating table. It had a heart attack. It needs to rest now. So as long as nothing bad happens, the Roman Empire should be able to recover. Guess what happens? Yep. Something bad. And that bad is the end of the world. It's the Huns coming across Asia, having been kicked out by the Han Chinese dynasty, coming across Siberia, crashing into Russia, coming through the forest into what we would call Poland today, into the Vistula uh, River Basin, and just crushing through the various peoples into the Germans and the Goths, scaring the hell out of everybody. The Huns are in, they are um, I want to say they are war. They're either war or death of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Because Christians had no concept of like how to deal with this. So they looked at the Huns and said, what the hell? And they looked in their, they looked in their, their Bible, which makes total sense. And they're like, what the, what the, who are these? And they're like, ah, in revelations, there's horse peoples who come and destroy civilization, these are one of them. The Alani are another one. The Alans are another one. 
So the Germans and the Goths are foot people. They are not horsemen of the apocalypse. They don't have a lot of horses. They will pick up horses along the way once they invade the Roman Empire. But they are terrified of the Huns. And so the only place they can go to get out of the way of this wrecking ball. Do you guys remember uh, Miley Cyrus's song Wrecking Ball? And there was the video that was attached to it. You can you can look it up on YouTube. And she swings on a wrecking ball wearing no clothes. Well, if Miley Cyrus is on a wrecking ball coming at you, if Miley Cyrus naked on a wrecking ball is coming at you, what do you do? The answer is you get out of the way. Well, the Germans can only go west. The Goths can only go south into the Roman Empire. And so if you're looking at our map, look at the destruction that's going to happen. All of these lines come into the Roman Empire and just overwhelm the Romans. So what happens? No Huns, nomadic horse lord barbarians, nomads, right? That we talked about in day one of this class, invade Europe. They scare the Goths, they scare the Germans and push them into the Roman Empire looking for safety. They overwhelm the borders. Romans flee into the core. Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, southern, southern Gaul, southern France. They flee towards the, the core looking for safety. So... The Germans and the Goths are refugees, right? And they're bumping into Romans, turning them into refugees on the borders. This is, looks like the Bronze Age collapse again, and they're being pushed by nomads. This looks like this is exactly what happened with the Bronze Age collapse. Nomads hit other people who then moved into other people who then pushed those people. And so everyone is this rolling refugee train. But, but... The Roman Empire is 40 to 50 million people, and this is only maybe 250,000 people. And Rome had Nascio. It had the secret ingredient. Nascio is, we can take those 250,000 people. We defeat them. We crush them. We show them that we are superior so we could defeat the Goths and the Germans in battle, and then we can make them Roman. We could turn them into Romans. And then we could all unite, defeat the Huns. All Rome has to do is win a massive battle to show the Goths or the Germans who's boss. And since the Goths invaded first, it was the Goths. But it makes this is this is not a problem. And in fact, it wasn't seen as a problem because of Nascio. It was like, okay, we defeat them, convert them into Romans, just like we did with lots of other people. Turn them around, fight the, fight the Huns, defeat the Huns. Everything goes back to the way it was. It's great. And in fact, we now how would have, it would be even better because now the Goths, the Goths and the Germans would now become Roman citizens. We get their loyalty. We would get their taxes. It would be great. Everything will turn out fine. All we have to do is win one massive battle to show the Goths who bo who's boss. And when the Goths come crossing over the border, they, they come to a place called Adrianople, outside of the capital city of Constantinople in the east. Perfect place, big wide open field. Boom. Perfect place for the Romans to have their victory. And so they get the Battle of Adrianople, and they lose. And it is a devastating loss. The emperor is killed. The Goths and the Germans don't respect Rome at this point. The, the Germans see what happens and they just flood over the border. They're like, oh, we're just going to come over the, the Rhine River and flood into France. You know, we're not even going to bother. We're not worried about the Roman army at all. The emperor is killed, which sets off a civil war, uh, a brief civil war between the, between the generals. The Germanic tribes start overwhelming Britain, France, Spain, and Africa, looking for a place to settle out of the way of the Huns. The Roman emperor is unable to protect the provinces. The Roman army is not reliable enough to win against barbarians. The Roman people are exhausted by, an, by emperor failures. So people give up on Rome. The empire cracks into two, into a western half and an eastern half. Every, every province is now for themselves. Local patricians start to make deals with the Germans and the Goths as they march through in order to stay in power and protect their plebeians. 
and protect their own positions. People stop caring about the Roman emperor. And the 300s and the 400s, it's amazing. It is, am especially in the West, it is amazing just how bad the Roman emperors are. It really is just one after another after another are just terrible. It is really, whereas during the Punic Wars or during the, the Samnite Wars the, the, and the Gallic Wars earlier, like there was one great general after another. And when one general goes down fighting, they get another council and he's just better than the last. You know, they could find a Scipio or a Cincinnatus. They could pull these guys out and win. And in the 300s, a f empire of 40 million people couldn't find anybody. It's all scrubs. It's all D, C plus, C minus emperors. They're just terrible. They do some good things, but there, there's nobody on a Trajan, a Hadrian, an Octavian scale. There's just none. It's amazing just how much lack of talent there is by 400 AD. You have to wonder why. What, what happened? Where did all the good people go? And what, where they went was to the provinces. The Roman emperors and all those civil wars during the 200s basically chased good talent away, which is something you should know. You should learn from this if you want to start a company, if you want to be a startup. You need to be able, you need a deep bench of good workers, of managers, of people who could step in when things go wrong that you can call upon because otherwise it's just you. And if you're not up to the task, and sometimes that's hard to admit, but you're not, you need to be able to pull in other people with other skill sets. And if you don't have them, if you've chased them away, your, the systems that you're building will collapse. Your company will collapse. So the, the Battle of Adrianople, the collapse of the Roman Empire, is a good lesson for any entrepreneur to learn from about how to organize talent. The Roman Republic had a deep bench of talent. It groomed talent. It, it incentivized talent to rise. The empire didn't. And so exhausted people made deals that were best for them, but were terrible for Rome. The empire breaks into two. The Western Roman Empire, which was based in Rome, gets Italy, Spain, France, Africa, North Africa, and Britain. And as we already talked, most of those are being overrun by the Franks, by the Germans, by the Alemanni, by the Vandals. The Vandals will actually go all the way through Spain be like, can we settle here? Can we settle here? Can we settle? They'll actually get ships. They'll capture a navy and become the largest navy <laughs> in the Mediterranean for a brief time. These are people who have never seen like the ocean and they actually will invade North Africa and Morocco. We get the word vandalized from these guys. These are not tough guys. Scipio could have crushed these guys and they made it all the way to North Africa. The Eastern Roman Empire based at Constantinople, which is more Christian, and richer because it has Greece and Egypt in it, um, has Greece, Asia Minor, the Levant, Palestine, Egypt. The East is more urbanized. It's more Christian. It's more culturally unified. It's richer. It's older, right? Remember, the Romans have, you know, they, yeah, Southern Italy and Sicily are old. Um, Carthage is old. But a lot of the other places weren't, in the empire very long, 100, 200 years tops, whereas Greece is an empire for 2,000 years at this point. 2,000 years? Yeah, something like that. 1,500 years? But Constantinople will build massive walls. This is what Theodosius uh, starts to do. So Theodosius is not apparently a great emperor, but awesome planner. Because he builds these massive walls that just stop in barbarian invasions. The barbar barbarians don't know how to build walls. They're barbarians. 
So they hit the walls, they look up and go, what are we supposed to do with that? They're, you know, land-based nomads. They look at the walls, shrug, and go away. And so Constantinople is going to be defended by these massive, and I, I mean, they are 60 feet tall. They are three levels deep. I mean, they are totally massive. It's going to take a cannon and gunpowder to break them down. And so there it is on our map, Constantinople. We'll talk about Constantinople when we talked about the Byzantines. So we have two empires, the West and the East. Now notice on our map, the West is getting completely overrun by all those squiggle lines. The East, on the other hand, everything West and South of Constantinople, totally safe. Constantinople was a plug and the barbarians would hit it and bounce off. So Asia Minor, totally safe. Syria, totally safe. Egypt, the richest place on earth, totally safe from barbarian invasions. Greece, all right, that's bad. But they didn't settle there. They kept going. They went to Italy. So Greece could be rebuilt. The Danube, you could refortify. You could put forts on it again, and you kind of block. You could block invasions. So you could recover something that can't happen in the West. The West is just getting overrun. So now we have two empires, the Western and the Eastern Roman Empire, to fight the Goths, the Germans, and the Huns. Okay, so it's, so that sounds like it should be better, right? The Western Emperor concentrates on the West. The Eastern Empire Emperor concentrates on the East. Should be okay, right? You have less to worry about, so you can concentrate. The truth is, no. Both emperors were jealous of each other. Both want to be the one Roman Emperor. Remember, we talked about this. Is Rome big enough for two leaders? Turns out... 400 years later it's still not big enough so they spend more time fighting each other uh they actually bribe dramatic tribes to invade the other's territory so roman emperors rather than work together to save the roman empire actually undermine the roman empire trying to fight each other in 410 the goths sack rome effectively ending the emperor's power the emperor can't control Italy. He can't control his army. It's it's he it has just spun out of control. And in 476, the last emperor in Rome, a teenager, is forced to quote retire, take a vacation, don't come back. By a German, by a, by a Ostrogothic king, by a German king, he says, "I don't need you anymore. Go away." So there's only Constantinople left. And the remaining Roman emperor, who is called the Roman emperor, he is a Roman emperor, doesn't own or live in Rome or Italy, which brings up the question, how Roman could he be? Culture, he speaks Latin. He's a Christian. But he lives in Constantinople on the border between Greece and Asia Minor. He's literally at the end of the European world. He's at the border between Europe and Asia. He's at what the Greeks called the Hellespont, the end of Greece, the beginning of Asia. Right across the sea, where now there's a bridge, there's a bridge, the Istanbul bridges. Now, right where he is, that's the end of Europe. So, instead of being in the core of Europe, he's at the edge of it. How Roman could he possibly be? How European can he be? And that will be a question that will come up again and again and again in the Byzantine Empire, in how Westerners treat the Byzantines. So what are our results? Our results is Europe returns to a hyper-local chieftain warlords controlling war small areas world. A world before the Roman emperors conquered things. A world before the Roman Republic conquered things. Where every mountain or valley was a separate kingdom. Spain before the Punic Wars. Where you get thousands of kings, quote unquote, with armies of maybe 500 to 1,000 warriors. Not soldiers. Because they're in no way professional. These are young men, middle-aged men who have a sword or a spear, a shield, 
and they, they are loyal to one man. And there's thousands of them. The, the world breaks up. There are no maps. I can't find any maps because they go, oh, the Franks own this. Yeah, but they really didn't. The best way of, of understanding just how broken up things are is to read some of the, um, like the Last Kingdom, some of the historical fiction of the early Dark Ages. I think it's Bernard Cromwell, Cornwell, Cornwell. Um, he wrote The Last Kingdom. And so he wrote, writes about a bunch of Arthur books. This is where, like, Britain goes from being a province in a large empire, one giant state within a large empire, to being broken up into, like, 40 different little kingdoms. And lots of different cultures. You have the Scots and the Picts up in the north. You've got the British, you've got the Roman British trying to hold on in, in Wales. You've got... um Cornwall being broken up into three, four different kingdoms, you know, they will sooner or later coalesce into four big kingdoms. But for a while, it's all these little kings, all these little, and what do they do? They spend all their time fighting each other. And they have these tiny armies. It's the opposite of the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor controlled 40 million people. He controlled 3,000 miles uh, north and 3,000 miles east to west. And what he said went and was respected his army was 250,000 people who were loyal to him so what Ro Europe completely breaks apart it's like glass it's like a, a windshield you've hit with a sledgehammer it breaks into all these little shards and each little shard is completely independent of every other little shard they used to be one big piece one unified piece when you drive around with your with your windshield it's one piece of glass but when you break it when you really smash it it smashes into a million little pieces but and this is the funny thing is rome still had some legs still had some power and we see this at the battle of chelon the battle of chelon in 451 the Franks, who will become the French, but the Germanic tribe, they're Germans, they're not French yet, they're Germans, but they're known as the Franks, ally with the Roman army of the West. The Roman army can't do this on its own. It can't defeat the, the, the Huns on its own. It knows it. So it allies with the Franks. The enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. And they turn around and they fight the Battle of Shalon against Attila the Hun, and they win. It is savage fighting, but it is one. Shalon is one of the most important battles in the history of Europe. Why? Because it saves Europe for Europeans, quote unquote. Attila um, will claim victory in the battle you know, at the very least, it's a draw, but it's actually a defeat because he's going to have to withdraw. He's going to have to back up. He can't continue invading um, the Roman Empire. He then dies of a brain aneurysm, of what we think is a brain aneurysm. He drank heavily that night in celebration, and apparently he was not a drinker. Uh, he took um, some women to bed, um, and he died in his sleep. The women were accused of murdering him, um, so they were executed. Um, so people didn't understand brain aneurysms. Um, and his two brothers both claimed to take over. And what happened is the host, the Hun, uh, army broke into two, one following one brother, one following another. One brother would reinvade the Roman empire, would reinvade Europe and get crushed and be exting exterminated, be bl blotted out. The other would end up back in, um, would end up back in the Ukraine of all places where they would have a long history being uh, nomadic peoples on the edge of the nomadic steppe. So they went back where nomads come from. Uh, there's a reputation that a group that, that the, the first group ends up, uh, the survivors end up occupying a, the, a plane, the, what we, what we call the Hungarian plane. They become hung, you know, Hungary, Hungary becomes the land of the Huns. 
it's 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 more um, mythological than true. Um, it's not that they're it's completely implausible. It's that in the 900s, a new group of nomadic peoples, the Mayard, Mayards, moved in, settled in what we call Hungary, and became the Hungarians. So, if there were Huns there, they they got assimilated. So okay, so the name lives on more than the people do. Why is all of this important? It means Europe is going to be run by Europeans, the European Germans, who have a long history, not of being friendly with the Romans, but of interacting with them. The Germans are native to Europe. Uh, they are on the continent. They're not part of European Christian Mediterranean culture, but they can be. And that's what exactly what will happen not who the Huns are, who are Turkish Asiatic nomads from China. So what the Battle of Shalon does is basically make the Germans, and to a lesser extent the Goths, into Europeans, into quote-unquote Europeans. Now they lived in Europe, but they weren't part, they weren't Christians, they weren't part of that Roman Greek culture, but they will be. And from basically 451 till... The 1815, the French, the Franks will be the leading or a leading kingdom in Europe for the next 1400 years. If they are not the leading kingdom in Europe, they're in the top three, at least until 1815. And you can make the argument at least until 1940. So, you know, 1500 years. Christianity dies out to father the provinces from Italy. But, so, like, Britain, like, the father sons of Britain, they stop being Christians altogether. You have to re-Christianize them. Um, the same is true in Portugal and Spain, who will actually be conquered by Muslims in the 700s. You ha they'll have to be re-Christianized. Uh, the further you get away from Italy and from Constantinople, the less Christian you are. It just dies out. There's just not as many priests, not as many people. The The culture is not as, the roots are not as deep in the Roman Greek tradition. But the Catholic Church is the only Roman institution to survive in the West. And so what they do is they make alliances with kings. These kings, remember these kings, these thousands of kings? The priests, the priesthoods, the church will make alliances. And what they do is they get conversion they get these kings to 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 agree to become Christian for their people to become Christian in exchange for legitimacy that the church will say to the peasants the roman peasants pay your taxes don't revolt help and and help help these conquerors work with them and the church will actually administer the collection of taxes will write the laws because the church is the only literate ones and so taxes, peace, the administration of these guys' kingdoms, they'll have a priest at their left hand. They'll have their generals on their right and their priests on their left. And the idea is, okay, the Christian God may be powerful or may not be powerful. It takes a while for the polytheistic gods of the Germans to die out. And what actually happens is a lot of that becomes Jesus. Jesus takes on a lot of those powers, like Christmas is a barbarian um, solstice um, fertility holiday. And what happens is it becomes Christian. It becomes about Jesus. Oh, Jesus is born in December when everything is dead. And he's the new life. Oh, that makes total sense. Okay? You can't uh, hammer, you can't put nails through people's heads and nail them into trees. How about... We put candles on the trees to symbolize the Holy Ghost and the light of Jesus and, and Christianity. The light of the gospel. And people go, okay. So what happens is the barbarian stuff doesn't so much die as it gets absorbed in. We'll talk about the days of the week when we talk about Vikings. As Jesus takes on aspects of these polytheistic gods. So people are like, well, my God does X. And he's like, well, Jesus can do that. So that's what happens. Um, Christianity, 
we remember, which hates Roman culture, right? The Christians were oppressed by the Romans for uh, 300 years. Pogroms, genocides, arrests, being thrown to the lions. Christians were oppressed. They turn out to be the protectors of Greek and Roman culture and knowledge. The Catholic Church claims legitimacy by saying we are the true Romans. It is the weirdest thing. But faced with the barbarians, the Catholic Church ends up being, well, we'll save Roman culture. Because Roman culture gave the Catholic Church its legitimacy in its age, in its knowledge. And so it's the Catholic Church that will save Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and Tacitus and Cicero. It's the Catholic Church that will save these things in what's called the Dark Ages. The, the Byzantines do too, because the Byzantines are Roman. They are Greek-speaking Romans. And so this is their heritage, and they will save this stuff as well. But in the West, it's in the West, there is no institution with any form of legitimacy, with any form of literacy that can save this stuff except for the Catholic Church. And it's ironic that they're the ones to do it because they worked to overthrow the Roman culture, which was pagan, which is polytheist. And so what we get is these broken up kingdoms in the West. And you can see this. We got the, the Vandal Kingdom, the Visigothic Kingdom, and the Ostrogothic Kingdom, and the Frankish Kingdom. And that's not one king running that. There might be one superior king, but there's so many little chiefs. These are just broken up into thousands of little pieces. The purple in the purple pink on the right, the Byzantine Empire is still an empire. It is still one guy running the show from a capital. But in the West, that map is a lie. That map makes it look like it's more organized than it is. It's just not. It's just at the local level, every little chieftain calls themselves a king. Every little valley is its own little kingdom. And so the Roman Empire has come to an end. But its cultural aspects survive. The Senate, for example, continues to meet. People continue to read Tacitus. Marcus Aurelius's Meditations is continued to be a handbook for how to be a good leader. The Byzantines long to reunite the Roman Empire. They're not done yet. They're in Constantinople. They're recovering from the invasions. They're rebuilding. And the emperor, the Roman emperor in Constantinople, dreams of reoccupying Rome and reuniting the Roman Empire. That, that 476 the last emperor, that 410, the sack of Rome, were just humiliations. They were setbacks, but we can recover. Didn't, wasn't Jesus resurrected? Why can't the Roman Empire be? And so that's the end of the Roman Empire. It dies in the West. It continues in the East. Its culture continues in both the West and the East, even if it has to change. So thank you. This is the end of the Romans. Take care.